Um, hi, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to this next installment of the Huckabee College of Architecture's fall lecture series entitled Publicness. Um, my name is Nadi Mai, assistant professor here at the college and chair of the lecture event exhibition and publication committee. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and thank everyone on this LEAP team that makes these events possible. Uh, our fearless leader, Rachel Rowe, Lindsay Mims, Oscar Natividad, Jeff Hoover, Denny Mingus, Tim Bender, uh, as well as HCOA faculty representatives uh, Asma Mehan, Christy Weir, um, and David Turturro. Special thanks to Tara Mayer and our Dean Ube Flukiger, who have been instrumental in developing and coordinating our fall lecture series lineup. Um, this afternoon, I'm excited to welcome uh, Kevin Kim Willie as our next lecturer. Uh, this lecture is remarkable for several reasons. One, uh, we are honored to have Kevin join us and speak to speak to us about his outstanding work. And two, when this lecture series was being formed, our committee was approached by TTU's chapter of the National Organization of Minority Architecture Students, NOMAS, uh, to request Kevin come to our college and speak about his work. Kevin's lecture today, today represents a fantastic dovetailing of the college's and students' interest in contemporary architectural discourse. I'd like a moment to recognize NOMAS's current leadership, who's in the front row, which includes Emily Perez, uh, Gibran Hernandez, Annalise Lopez, Hayden Smith, and Jesse Fung. With that context, uh, today's lecture will be orchestrated by NOMAS. Um, Annalise and Hayden will be conducting the introduction, and Emily and Gibran will be moderating the Q&A. Uh, thus, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Annalise and Hayden to the podium to introduce today's speaker. All right, thanks so much. Okay, so with Kevin, his architectural studies and professional experience span from Kenya to South Africa with global cooperations in the USA, Germany, and India. His focus has led him into community development work in South, South Africa, where he is currently based his doctoral research in the use of alternative design and technology as an agent of social change merges the environmental aspects with the social economic impact and applies a transdis transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approach. His ambitions with RDI engages several academic institutions locally in Europe and in the US. Well traveled in the Eastern, Southern Africa and Central Europe his work explores alternatives in both design and development, grounding the green agenda in affordable and low-tech sustainable solutions. He was a finalist in 2017 Design Indaba's Most Beautiful Architect in South Africa. He won the 2018 SAPOA winner for the overall most transformational project, and he won the 2019 South African Institute of Architects Regional Award. He has also been numerously featured on news articles such as CNN, The Guardian, SABC Television, <clears throat> Deutsche Stadt, Well Television Germany, M. Netz, Carte Blanc, and has been featured in architectural magazines such as Architectural Record, Metropolis Magazine New York, to mention a few. He has been selected in the Creative Climate Coalition 2022 COP27 in Egypt. And on that note, let's switch it over to Kevin Kimwell. Kevin, sorry, I think you're muted. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for those kind words and introduction. Um, so my name is Kevin Kimole. I'm a researcher, stroke academician, stroke uh, uh, practicing architect. And the work that I do kind of steps uh, has to fit one foot in uh, practice, which means I engage live projects uh, to create case studies or pilot projects that tests ideas that are then pulled into the academic space and then uh, go into the whole uh, rigorous process of um, uh, strengthening, strengthening them, be it from academic theory or be it from building uh, prototypes and strengthening prototypes in uh, communities. So uh, my presentation today will be, um, I'll talk you through a couple of case studies that have happened uh, over, uh, I think, a period of about five, seven years where we tested different ideas. And I will start with the West Picker um, 
just because uh, West speakers are superheroes with the West super uh, with the West superpower, as my friend Mudano says. Uh, this is because they make West disappear from you know our, our cities, uh, but we never really, really, truly appreciate them. Uh, anyway, the story of Kusamoko, this West speaker, uh, we were told of a West speaker's cut that had been knocked by a truck, and uh, some friends of ours had decided to try rebuild it. Uh, so I, I, I found Kustamoko and I kind of thought, well, there must be more, more to it than that. So I tracked him for about six, eight months, really trying to understand uh, Kustamoko, uh, the waste collector, and understand his life and the processes. And this is just a bit of a summary of uh, six, to eight, six to nine months. Uh, I realized he's a broccolier in the sense that he collects a lot of waste. He sorts out the waste and wherever he needs to um, um, uh, trade. Uh, he uses a butter trade method. Uh, he takes it in, but the rest of it, he keeps it uh, for himself for his own use. So he builds, um, he's built his entire house out of uh, West material. Uh, he has uh, good fingers in the sense that he can, uh, he has a few trades uh, that he uses to make uh, money. Uh, and this is uh, from repairing shoes, he's a cobbler, uh, to repairing um, um, bikes and, you know, so he's a very crafted uh, old man uh, with great skills. And I thought um, uh, we also tracked where the material was coming from in terms of the township space and to where he was uh, moving it uh, in terms of the trade of area and just kind of having an idea of the different challenges. And what I mean by that is the challenge of collecting within uh, the township space and then moving through the city, through the urban space to uh, uh, through a major road into uh, the area where he would trade it off. Um, and um, so this is Kusa, this is his home. Uh, what we ended up doing uh, for, in this project is we actually built a waste cut. Then we upgraded that into a waste cut, uh, sorry, into a waste bike. So the waste cut essentially is for collecting waste within the township, a waste bike to move it into the new suburb where it is. But we also built him a home and a workshop, uh, which I will not showcase in this project. I'll speak of it in, um, uh, I'll showcase another project that uh, kind of indicates uh, the kind of intervention. So uh, let me just very quickly uh, share a video that kind of shows the, the, bicycle, um, you can see my screen, right? So what we did is uh, when I discovered that he was really good at uh, with his hands and he works with bicycles is we bought two kiddies bikes and we dismantled these bikes totally. And this is where R&D really comes in place. And by dismantling them, we were able to understand every component of that bike and see how to reuse that in a new structure or in a new uh, product, which is this waste cut. Uh, and we were able to create this waste cut in a way that would fit perfectly well in very narrow uh, situations within the township. So this is about 900 millimeters, um, um, just about a meter, so that he can maneuver this within um, um, within the township. And then after that, we upgraded that and we we built a waste cut uh, waste bike that you will see. And this, of course, was featured in the uh, local newspaper. I think the thing about this is we put a plate, a number plate for, um, uh, for uh, that uh, is his name, which is a big deal because it starts speaking of uh, a sense of pride in the job that he does. Um, and uh, it makes people aware uh, of the project. Um, give me one second. Let me go back to my other slide very quickly. And... Uh, so this is the West Bike. Um, uh, this is this one. Just give me one second. No. Yeah. So this is a West Cut. Um, and this is me just kind of taking in through the design. By the way, uh, we went into a secondhand shop. Uh, we bought this bike because this was his style. This is what he liked. Uh, the back of this waste cut is essentially rebuilt out of recycled material from the motor car industry. Port Elizabeth is like Detroit of the States, so we have a lot of uh, waste material that we can get from the motor car industry. And we kind of designed the back structure. Uh, over here, I was explaining to him how he can use the lights, how to connect the battery. And, uh, you know, the uh, the result is 
uh, people were slowing down in traffic to actually see what this thing is, this waistcoat, and the sense of dignity and the sense of appreciation, but also giving him visibility, you know, uh, so that people can see him uh, with his load um, uh, and giving him right of way. As I said, in this project, we actually ended up building him a home and a whisk, uh, a home and a studio. But I will showcase another uh, building that is a much more advanced building to that. Uh, I've also worked in Joe Slobo. Um, in South Africa, we have something we call communities in transition. Communities in transition are communities that uh, the government is slowly intervening, but they've kind of occupied a piece of land and that land has to be um, serviced. Uh, all the services have to get in. Everybody have to has to kind of have a, a parcel of it so that the infrastructure, the community infrastructure can go in. But that process in South Africa can take anything from a couple of months, a couple of um, a year maybe to 20 years. And that was the case in Joslovo. And what we did in the Joslovo Community Project is I tracked, uh, I realized when I got into that community through an asset-based community mapping process uh, that they were building already with uh, waste material, you know? And I, I was, so when I asked them, uh, so who builds this and where do you get it from? First thing is I, I realized that the, um, uh, many times our communities think that um, only architects can design. Uh, so they look, they kind of look down on their own um, uh, skill. And through the asset-based community mapping process, I was able to pull out the, the fact that they were building uh, their own structures, one, and that they were reusing uh, waste material. Um, so anyway, long story short, over a period of about a year, truck down where the pallets were coming from. The pallets were coming from Coca-Cola and GM, uh, General Motors, and found out uh, the quantity, the amounts, the quality of the stuff. And what we did there is after a very extensive, and I'm not going to talk about the extensive processes, uh, but after a very extensive process of negotiating uh, with the community and the municipality and various stakeholders, we realized then, uh, let's build a community center that could serve several functions, uh, right from uh, uh, the very dire need, which was uh, there was a preschool um, uh, with kids uh, in it, um, and the infrastructure that they were in, uh, the building that they were in was really, really terrible. And uh, what we have here is a community center essentially built out of recycled materials. So the walls over here, you can see a pallets. Uh, the front uh, wall is a one, a one bottle wall. Um, the new element in this building is the roof sheets. We've raised the entire building uh, because we realize uh, uh, pallets are uh, made of softwood. They're vulnerable to um, uh, getting dampness and uh, getting ruined very quickly. Uh, the main structure of the building is these gum poles that you see there. Uh, then we started looking at things like passive design, so lifting the building up uh, so that air can go uh, at the bottom, uh, which is over here, and it can also circulate on top so that the heat, which is captured here uh, and kind of absorbed, can uh, be ventilated and uh, released immediately. Uh, what you're looking at is basically uh, uh, this section here, pallets, uh, and it's a double skin uh, system with uh, plastic uh, running uh, in between it. By raising the building, uh, we also solved the other problem, which was uh, this here is the weak area because of the splash when it rains. So by raising the building and kind of creating a poly, um, um, uh, corrugated uh, iron sheet up from around the building, suddenly we're able to deal with that issue immediately. But the other thing is uh, what you're not seeing here is the foundation of this building is all made out of uh, concrete made out of uh, crushed glass. So instead of us mining new sand, we actually reuse and crush glass, uh, which uh, when you test the MPA, uh, the strength of it, it's much stronger than um, uh, conventional glass uh, to our surprise. Uh, so passive ventilation, natural lighting, uh, there's no electricity in this um, uh, community. At this stage, at least there wasn't. And uh, this is kind of what you see inside the building. So. Uh, this entire wall was facing north, which means uh, a lot of heat, uh, light rather, uh, goes in. It's a double skin uh, to absorb the, the light. And the result of it is this pixel fill. In this case, um, you can see it being used as a preschool, which was one of my favorite uh, functions. But we also incorporated other technology. Uh, so we discovered that there was a company in Johannesburg uh, that was building these toilets. 
for informal settlements. And what happens is in the morning, the teachers collect the water and bring it in. Uh, just to give you an idea of the context. So uh, one tap is shared by about 100 to maybe 200 households. Uh, that's the scale of this township. So it becomes very disruptive when the teachers have to go out all the time to find a toilet, to collect the water, to bring in the water. So we created this system so that the kids could wash their hands and flush the uh, flush um, uh, the toilet with the same water. Uh, but again, as you can see, the entire thing is uh, designed out of pallets. Uh, this image was what was selected and was a finalist for designing Daba's most beautiful object in South Africa. And for me, I love this image because uh, when you look at it, you see beauty, you see architecture, um, you, see, you don't see the engineering and the a number of sleepless nights we spent trying to figure out how to make this um, uh, structural wood uh, uh, shutter ply wall stand, you know, so the engineering part of it disappears and what you see is beauty, the margin of uh, this African atelier with this um, structural wall uh, in beauty. And it's a very important thing because uh, many times uh, when we design for poor and marginalized communities, we forget the factor of beauty. And in this community, this was a very big factor in them accepting uh, this building as a recycled building, uh, because in South Africa, there's a perception of, uh, well, actually in, in the world, uh, the perception is that uh, recycled buildings are inferior in terms of performance, in terms of beauty, you know, it will look like, you know, like a shack structure. Yet in this case, we're able to produce architecture and not only architecture, we're able to produce beauty and give this material uh, um, and the, the community using this building uh, dignity. Um, the work uh, uh, has, um, so that's in the township space, which is outside of the CBD. With the Alliance Frances of Port Elizabeth, um, I worked with them with, uh, towards uh, exhibition, uh, exhibiting uh, green projects. So in this case, uh, we had a, a street, a Fête de la Musique, which is a street music festival. And right from the onset, we put the green agenda first, you know. So this poster here, which is a Richmond Hill Fest Festival uh, poster, when you look at it, the background of it is a palette, you know. So the conversation already begins right at the beginning of the whole street festival in announcing it. And uh, throughout the uh, festival, uh, the furniture, um, the exhibition was very much pushed uh, with the green agenda. And, uh, you know, at times, when we are talking about the green agenda, we can be what we call a green fascist. We can, we can be very hard in kind of uh, giving people very hard data and, you know, and making it very gloomy, you know, uh, and impossible uh, for people to engage. And I think this was on a lighter side. So in this case, uh, for example, this wall here, uh, this exhibition wall, which was part of the main stage that you're looking at here, um, this whole thing is paper tubes. We collected paper tubes for about six months. We cut them and we created the screen, uh, which is what you're seeing here. That whole structure is about 30 meters um, by 15 meters high. We had to hold that whole thing uh, using uh, rainwater tanks, uh, anchor this uh, onto the ground, because this is a strict festival, right? And then at the bottom over here, um, what you can see are actually screens of different stories of different people within uh, uh, the community. And this is, uh, so here we start talking, sorry, just give me one second. Here we are talking about um, uh, engaging the city, essentially engaging uh, 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 the city in conversations in the green agenda, but in a very soft, in a very light manner that, um, um, and throughout the festival, a lot of people are like, are you sure that's paper tubes, you know, and them really coming and uh, looking at it and touching it and then further on uh, engaging uh, with the conversations that we had recorded and then joining the, fest uh, the festival, the music festival. Um, then I'm going to speak about... Um, Gogo Selena, um, um, in South Africa, so by the way, Gogo means granny, and the generation of, uh, which is currently about 65 to about 85 years old uh, in South Africa, we call them the forgotten generation because uh, there has been a lot of promise um, uh, with the new liberated South Africa uh, in terms of free housing, free education, et cetera, et cetera. And um, however, uh, 
these are very hard um, promises to fulfill. You know, the population of South Africa, the discrepancy between the rich and poor, uh, social inequality, et cetera, et cetera. And this generation in particular seems to have fallen through the cracks uh, of history in terms of, well, they're not remembered. And um, in this case, um, this we were called to this project. The community identified uh, Selena uh, because this structure's uh, uh, roof was actually collapsing. The ceiling was collapsing. So it's a one room structure, uh, which she's lived in since, um, uh, 1954, I believe. Uh, it's an old structure that was built uh, during the old apartheid times. And what she did is she extended the front to be a bit of a living room and the back to be a bit of a bedroom. But because that uh, ceiling was collapsing, she was only able to use one part of it. Um, her child, her daughter had died at, uh, during childbirth. So she was taking care of her 15-year-old uh, at that time, a 15-year-old um, grand granddaughter. Uh, so this is a bit of the uh, building. So let me just maximize my screen uh, just to kind of give you a, a, a feeling of what inside is. And uh, so what we did is uh, with the help of Isuzu, um, we went into the motor car industry and we salvaged as much as we could. Uh, what you're looking at here are collapsible shipping containers. Uh, we took the wood within the ship, uh, collapsible shipping containers and we created uh, laminations. Uh, which is what you're seeing here. So we laminated new columns, new beams, uh, and then we use the uh, uh, these bottom of the collapsible shipping containers to create a floor. Again, we use the same uh, previous learned lessons. Uh, so with the concrete in this building is all uh, from crushed glass. Uh, this was a building that we built during COVID, uh, which was very challenging because we could only be five people on site at one time. And that, you, if you remember, COVID was almost the entire 2021. Um, and we had to be careful, obviously, to protect uh, Gogo Selina, uh, who over here you can see is inspecting the building. So we built uh, a big chunk of the building in a factory setup, uh, in a warehouse setup. Uh, so it's a prefab structure. And then we erected it on site um, uh, as fast as we could. This is one of those uh, late nights uh, where the building is starting to come to life. So you can see uh, uh, a bit of the design. Um, this is the end product. And uh, so this is Gogo Selena in her new building uh, with a friend that's visited. Believe it or not, this entire building is actually recycled. This floor here is a yellow wood floor that we found had been thrown out in one of the salvaging sites. And we took the, the wood, uh, we didn't know it was yellow wood, but when we cleaned it up, we discovered it was really good wood. The columns and the beams are all recycled. The only thing that we could not recycle is the wiring that goes into the conduit, uh, into the conduits and the plumbing work, uh, just because of the, uh, the quality that it has to be. Uh, so all these uh, circuits that you're seeing here, all these are recycled, uh, but the copper tubing, uh, the conducting and the wiring that is going inside is all uh, new. Um, and this is why we do what we do, you know, having a look at uh, Michelle, who's um, Gogo Selena's granddaughter. Uh, she has a space on top here where she can study by herself. We created a two bedroom house uh, with um, a, a living room. It's a, kind of a semi uh, open uh, layout that's linked to the old um, to the old structure. Uh, this is a bit of a, um, an axonometric of the building. Uh, let me just explode it a bit. I'll start with the bottom. So what we've done at the bottom is we've used um, tires to hold the ground and stop the ground from moving uh, because the area where this house is, uh, the soil is not good. It, when it floods, there's a lot of uh, water penetration. We're building a new uh, strip foundation, raise it off from the ground, and then we put in the collapsible shipping container uh, frame uh, to create a study floor. With the old structure, and remember this is a heritage structure because uh, it was built in, in 1954, we took the two windows, which is the reason uh, the two, the beam to the two windows had collapsed, but we took the two uh, windows, salvaged them, and we raised the, um, the original structure uh, so that it could have better thermal uh, control. Uh, so there's a larger volume, which means you can regulate uh, the building better with air. Uh, and those are the two windows over there. And then uh, uh, we uh, uh, we restored the uh, old fireplace. Um, over here, you can see the main 
column system of the building is laminated wood. We laminated this wood ourselves in the laboratory, uh, in the workshop. And um, uh, this was uh, this was the part that we could control and we could move uh, really, really quickly. And then uh, the surrounding of the building is basically um, the collapsible shipping container uh, uh, steel. In between it, we put um, a thermal insulation, which we harvested from um, refrigerator containers. So uh, in the motor car industry, we found an area where they would bring all these old uh, uh, freight containers, um, refrigerator containers, and they would kind of just try and scrap them as much as possible. And the stuff that is very hard to get rid of is the foam that goes inside. In this case, we took the foam, we cut it into cubes, and then we were able to slide it in between the metal sheet and the uh, frame. Uh, so the inside of it is then uh, isoboards. Uh, and then the uh, there's a whole uh, ribbon lighting on the top of the building to create lighting. Um, we had an issue of um, this is a, 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 a uh, the the family is female dominated in a township environment in South Africa. And if you've looked at the stats of uh, crime in South Africa because of the discrepancy between the rich and poor, it's very high. Uh, and how do you secure um, uh, two women, uh, one very young and one very old? So what we did is the entire building can close, can lock up. You know, they can lock themselves up because this collapsible shipping container uh, locks the doors uh, uh, can uh, can lock. And uh, what that does is then we have that light ribbon, uh, light ribbon on top so that uh, lighting is coming in. And over here, uh, we created an atrium space uh, so that natural lighting can come through. So um, you can see a bit of the uh, polycarbonate. So we use employed a lot of polycarbonates over here, the collapsible shipping containers, um, the isoboards before they were painted, uh, the floor before it was recycled, uh, sorry, it was brought in. Um, and um, yeah, so I will come back to that structure uh, a little later. We've also worked with the NGOs. Uh, in this case, we worked with the German uh, NGO Masifunde. Uh, in this case, they needed um, a community center, um, and they had gotten into this deal with the municipality uh, on uh, a building that would have been a little bit conventional. And we tried and we tried our best to design a new building for them <laughs> that uses uh, recycled material. Uh, so, uh, and even though it was a very hard conversation, especially with the funders uh, and with the municipality, uh, we were able to pull off a few things. So it's a negotiation process. Uh, in this case, we were able to create the walls, uh, internal walls, create a passive ventilation system and reuse as much brick as possible uh, over here. Uh, this was one of the very, very early works and uh, it kind of just marks a uh, transit in terms of the conversations and the engagement uh, with the uh, funders and the professional consultants. Our ongoing and last work at the moment is a uh, uh, it's a food kiosk in uh, the waterfront of uh, Cape Town. Uh, the Cape Town waterfront is one of the most expensive pieces of land in Africa, uh, just because of the kind of uh, uh, investment and a kind of uh, corporate that uh, has been pulled in here. Um, and um, it's a highly developed uh, precinct, very, very well developed. And um, because of that kind of development, um, there's a lot of uh, construction going on. Uh, and what we did in this case, uh, what you're seeing here is the precinct of the waterfront. We, uh, what is dotted here is uh, all the demolition sites where we could salvage and scavenge materials. And we brought all those materials and through a process of educating both the client and the professional consultants and uh, my team on what we were doing. How do we salvage wood? How do we break it down? Where do we move it? So these are kind of uh, some of the infographics uh, that we uh, kind of uh, showcased. Uh, over here is a little bit more of a detail of what is coming from where. So for example, from these two sites, uh, which is Africa Mall and the Helipad, uh, we got roof sheets, uh, Rebels, um, uh, we got them from this side over here, you know, the wine bottle walls, uh, concrete uh, brick. So we've kind of mocked up the entire area. But more than that, we've also uh, identified the elements that are coming from there. So the quantities, uh, how many pieces of timber did we get from site X, how many doors, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very 
uh, it's a very rigorous uh, uh, process. In fact, we've gone to the point where we've actually calculated, uh, just give me one second, uh, this jumped. Uh, we've gone into the process of tracking all our movement within that site. So where's the material coming from? What are we salvaging? What vehicle picked it up? What is the capacity of that vehicle? Uh, with the idea of calculating the carbon footprint that we are creating in this process. So it's a very rigorous and extensive process. Uh, I mean, this project has uh, taken us about two years uh, and we're handing it over in uh, October. And uh, what you're looking at now, uh, a bit of a rudimentary um, 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 artistic impressions uh, with the idea of educating both the waterfront, our team, the professional consultants um, and everybody on what the materials are and where they're going. So the bricks that we had salvaged, uh, that's where they're going. The glass bricks that we salvaged from uh, site X are over here. The old circus that we reused, uh, the steel fence that we are now using as um, uh, pagola, uh, the old railing that we are now using as stair, um, uh, as handrails, you know, uh, the old windows uh, bottle, uh, we reused some of our um, ideas like the wine bottle wall, uh, collapsible shipping containers, etc., etc. And uh, this is a bit of a refined uh, artistic pressure. Uh, what we've also done is within this project, uh, uh, and uh, in responding to the uh, urgency of climate change, uh, you know, we, we used to speak about sustainability, but now we realize we actually need to think about system thinking, you know, systemic change. And uh, for example, in this case, what we've motivated is that there's a piece of ground next to the food pavilion that the vegetables and spices are actually grown there. And that stuff then goes into the um, into the building. Yes, part of it is as a we know we will not produce all the food for the um, uh, for the cafe here, but it is a statement. It it starts opening up to this whole idea of uh, uh, circularity. Uh, these are some of the artistic impressions of that building. So this entire building is so this building here is ninety eight percent recycled. The two percent again is. Uh, it goes to things like conditioning, uh, some of the plumbing works. In this case, even the roof, um, the thermal insulation, all of it is recycled. And sorry, and uh, applications, you know, fire retardants and things like that, you have to uh, use new. So these are artistic impressions of um, uh, this building. Um, we talk about, I mean, from a uh, uh, I'm not going to speak about the design from uh, passive design, et cetera, et cetera, just because those those by now, as you can tell, are, are, um, are, are standard. Uh, what I mean by standard is uh, those go in for all the projects that we work in, we think passive design. So natural lighting, as much natural lighting as possible, uh, collecting all the rainwater, um, uh, thermal insulation and thermal mass orientation of the building. Uh, in this case, we think about the life cycle of the building, reuse of uh, certain elements. Uh, the space is multiple, uh, multi-purpose in nature. So in this case, it's a food cafe, but it can also be an exhibition hall. So future-proofing it essentially, it can be an exhibition hall. It can be used as a studio. It can be, used, you know, so really thinking about the challenges of the, um, of the present uh, times and uh, producing an architecture or a design that responds to it. So it's not just about recycling and reuse and uh, circularity, but it's also about future proofing uh, the design and producing good, beautiful architecture. Again, you can see all the lessons learned. So this is uh, our paper tube that we had, done, we had done a couple of years in an exhibition on the street. Now it's part of the uh, filter that uh, creates because there's polycarbonate. Uh, we recyc we're using recycled uh, polycarbonate. It doesn't look so good. So what we've done is we've created this filter so that when you look up, the light is filtered. You don't notice uh, all the um, uh, not necessarily good looking uh, uh, roof um, material. So this is an artistic impression of uh, what it will be. Um, give me one second, let me zoom out. So, sorry about that. That's where we are. I'm gonna quickly uh, plug in my computer charger so that it doesn't die. Um, I'm 
I'm going to show you this building as it is live on site at the moment. So this is what it looks like. Can you see my screen? Uh, so give me one second. How do I do this? So this is what the building looks like. Uh, I need to move this. Uh, so it's the building is already in construction. That's what it looks like. So it's all recycled material. As you can see, these are all the old windows that we've salvaged. Uh, all this brick, we harvested and salvaged all of it. Um, uh, we've even reused some of that uh, concrete that we uh, found in those uh, walls. So the building is uh, well under progress. And uh, the idea is we will hand it over in... Um, October. But you can see this whole construction site is almost um, a salvaging yard. Essentially, we have all the recycled materials. You can see the palisade fence, collapsible shipping containers, all of it, and we salvage and we uh, put it up in the building. Then I will quickly go back to my presentation um, over here. Zoom out, uh, I'll skip this one. So as a result of this, um, the the composition on this work is now starting to pull, uh, get traction, which is really important because uh, recycled buildings don't get so much limelight in mainstream uh, media just because, uh, again, of the idea or the perceptions that the material is inferior, the designs will be inferior. And by us starting to talk to main spaces like uh, the Green uh, Building Council, in this case, I spoke to, uh, uh, I was in their conference and we are actually using a Green Building Council tool. In this case, we've had to adopt an Australian tool, uh, brought it into South Africa so that we can contextualize it. But suddenly, uh, the conversation that was being seen as buildings that are inferior for marginalized communities are now uh, is right in uh, the center stage in uh, this kind of conversation. Uh, also, of course, we are in the activism space. This is the COP27, um, uh, where I formed part of a coalition of about 18 um architects and designers globally who are conscious about their design and uh, who are working within uh, the space of uh, marginalized communities. Um, I, th I love this uh, present uh, this slide here just because it kind of, I think, it, so this was a um, South African cities network who uh, kind of uh, captured the, um, the my story in, in, in form of a story chat, essentially. So the idea though that I, I wanna emphasize is that this kind of architecture is very collaborative in nature. Uh, even though I started off uh, from a research point uh, view, I uh, ended up uh, coordinating and working with the city, with the development agency, uh, with various professional consultants and kind of started bouncing ideas and uh, being able to negotiate and collaborate uh, with different stakeholders, uh, the community itself. Uh, in fact, before we build this community center, when we asked that community what they needed, they told us what they wanted. And the list was a bit shocking for us, you know. Uh, they were talking about shopping malls, um, stadiums, swimming pools, et cetera, et cetera. And us being able to narrow down and guide that community to eventually see what the need was, you know, that takes time. Uh, anyway, uh, and this here is the process of just bringing everybody uh, together. Uh, the accolades are really important because they help us validate the precedent uh, uh, and uh, show people that it is doable because uh, in South Africa, we did not have so many precedents of this being uh, doable. And collectively, uh, the work starts um, uh, pushing together the green agenda it gives it, it validates it. I, I guess that's what I was uh, um, uh, I was looking at. It validates it. And uh, suddenly a conversational material that was seen as inferior, uh, used by poor people only, is actually the solution to circularity, to the reusing, uh, to sustainability, uh, to uh, creating meaningful uh, social impact. 
So I will stop there. Um, I think I've spoken for quite a bit. Um, um, yeah, and I'll hand over, I'll hand back to you guys. So Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, we were just trying to fire the camera back up, but thank you for sharing that amazing work. I'd like to call up uh, Gibran and Emily now. They're gonna be our student representatives that are gonna be leading the Q&A. Um, so I think if you guys could hit the switch on your um, mics, that'd be great. And then, great, yeah. Hayden and Annalise, if you could, both of you kind of take one of the um, our ways to, to the circulate mics. Um, but yeah, go ahead, G. Brown and Emily, whenever you're ready, take it away. All right. Hello. My name is uh, G. Brown, and this is Emily. We are part of the Mouse. Um, and today we'll be hosting a QA. and um, So for the participants who are uh, on Zoom, feel free to uh, add a couple questions at the Q&A section of the uh, the uh, Zoom meeting. Um, I would like to start us off with a question for Mr. Kimwell. So Mr. Kimwell, I appreciate your time here at the uh, Huckabee College of Architecture. Thank you for uh, giving us an insightful uh, presentation about your work. Um, what I'd like to ask is, um, so do you have any sort of inspirations or works you uh, sort of admire that uh, inspires you to do your work? Uh, yeah, um, I have several inspirations. Um, I think the one, I think my Damascus moment, um, um, so let me step back. Uh, when I'd finished college and uh, university and I was a practicing architect, I decided to do this trip through Africa um, from Kenya, where, which is where I was born, uh, to South Africa. I did, I did a bit of a road trip. And um, as I was driving through uh, Africa, uh, I saw uh, need and um, dire need. And I realized that the architecture that I was practicing was not in any way trying to solve or help. Um, and what I mean by that is, so who who do poor people go to uh, for design, for architecture, you know? And uh, at times, uh, I mean, if you look at some of the structural failures and the problems that they, uh, this, the, um, housing uh, projects in the townships uh, in slums etc it's because we as architects have kind of been um, hijacked by the person who can afford us and we've kind of neglected this part of society so i guess one of my inspirations or aspirations um, uh, was to try solve this problem but at the same time uh, i saw a lot of ingenuity in in africa in these communities you know we think that we are teaching these communities to recycle and reuse, but it's the other way around. Everything, anything in the township gets used till death, you know. Uh, that kind of, um, uh, uh, the kind of material, uh, um, it will either be reused for storage, uh, it will be used for cooking, it will be fattened out and be used for um, a, something in a building, or uh, it will be fattened out and recycled uh, for sale, you know. So these communities are already recycling uh, um, uh, uh, to an extent beyond what we think. So I guess that is one of the areas of my inspiration. So the trip, of course, and me being able to see, have that Damascus moment and ask the question, so who will design uh, for these communities? And then the second part is uh, just seeing the kind of innovation and ingenuity in these communities. Thank you. Um, when choosing alternative materials, are, are there any guidelines or criteria you follow? Is there a general motivation to tr to really try and use everything you can find? The um, it depends with the context. Um, so in just local community, um, we realized that they had access to uh, pallets, and that was the one material that was. Um, dominant in all the structures that was there. Um, so I think the 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 answer is um, one find a material that is accessible to the community that they're already using that they're familiar with and then rethink how to use that material in an innovative way uh, 
uh, obviously through engineering and architecture and solve the problems, uh, as many problems as you can um, with it. Um, in a different community, for example, in Drakensberg, where we built, um, we worked with uh, earth, uh, essentially. So we built these uh, walls using earth and tires. We filled them up. Uh, so it's it's place specific. But what I can also say is that um, if you look at the building industry globally, it's almost identical. Uh, if you look at a city in South Africa uh, to a city in Europe or America or Asia, the materials are pretty much, you know, humanity has kind of unified. Uh, the global tech uh, is, you know, the cities look alike. So we know who the culprits are in terms of carbon footprint, so concrete. Uh, we know all buildings need uh, um, rebels, uh, wood, et cetera, et cetera. So these are now materials that have become standard uh, globally. And uh, this is an opportunity, of course, for us to uh, be able to engage with those materials in their second life and uh, push them back into uh, reuse. Uh, but to go back to the communities, um, when I get to a community and uh, I do the asset-based community mapping process, one of the processes is identifying the materials, the capability of the community uh, or capacity to access that material, the distances where they're getting that material from. And we also look at the uh, how much energy or knowledge do we need to convert that material uh, to a new building. Uh, if it takes too much energy, then it's not worth it. Uh, if it, what it's taking from us is a lot of laboratory uh, engineering uh, to produce a new building, but the material, uh, the embodied carbon and energy is low, then we go with that material. All right, looks like we uh, have a question in the Q&A um, by Professor Mayor. So she said, uh, hello, Kevin. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. It was thrilling to see the work. You talked a bit about the worldwide perceptions of inferiority and uh, pre-use materials. Could you talk a bit more about how you get clients to appreciate a recycle aesthetic? What do you do when they claim it is more expensive to salvage and refurnish old materials than you just buy new? Recycling requires additional labor. Do you find clients and pre, uh, pre just, just against uh, shifting projects budget to uh, labor costs? So um, this is a conversation that uh, uh, I realize, uh, especially with the stakeholders, uh, as we've moved from the township space more towards the city uh, and gate, for example, in, with the project with the waterfront, uh, this is a development agency uh, with the project with the um, NGOs in the city and the project with the um, the CBD. Uh, you know, these 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 are entities that. Uh, understand the challenge, uh, global challenge of uh, climate change, and they want to do something about it. And that does help. The fact that they have an idea uh, that there needs to be a shift in the building industry already does help. Uh, I think the tipping point is for us to be able to give them a press precedent, which we've done, uh, of showing them how to do it, how to do it economically, how to do it in a way that it impacts um, communities in a greater way. So uh, I'll speak a little bit about the waterfront project. Um, the, the driving factor for me there specifically is on realizing um, um, demolition sites are actually a mine for us to be able to uh, get a resource, which is old materials that can be reused. Yes, that's one aspect. But two, can you imagine the amount of uh, livelihoods you would create? Because uh, if you think of demolition sites as a wrecking ball, which is what we do in South Africa at the moment and uh, a lot of uh, parts of the world, we kind of pass a wrecking ball and we want to, demolition sites have to be brought, essentially that work needs to come down as quick as possible. And what we're trying to tell um, developers and agencies, actually, that's where the resource is. There's a lot of uh, carbon, there's a lot of energy, and there's the material itself. If we can harvest that, um, we will be able to reuse that and it will be cost effective later. 
But beyond that, how about the social economic impact? Suddenly, instead of uh, using a vehicle, a uh, caterpillar vehicle to kind of wreck a whole building and, you know, that's it. Uh, you can employ communities. You can employ people. You're creating livelihoods because uh, for you to pull down such a big building, you need a lot of hands. You need a lot of skills. And these are skills that are easy to attain, you know pulling down, um, getting the bricks one by one, you know, it's it's a very, once you get into the rhythm of it, it's very quick. But what you've done is you've created a job for somebody else and that job cannot be taken away by a machine. Um, so um, the inferiority is a big deal. And I think the precedence as you've seen is from an architecture point of view, we've tried to show that you can push the boundary with design, uh, creating beautiful, architecture, uh, architecture that is thoughtful in terms of passive design, etc., but architecture that is also beautiful. And uh, the way the buildings that have shown you behave, um, uh, it's not just a box, you know, it's it really speaks uh, of architecture. So the detailing of the column, how uh, the wood, uh, which is reused meets um, uh, metal beam, which is uh, scavenged, it would not be the same as you had them new. You have to rethink. So uh, we use an approach we call it. it essentially, we uh, the maker space that we use to create these buildings is a we use a make approach. A make approach is essentially you design by making stuff, by creating a lot of prototypes, and you start getting solutions that are very uh, intricate uh, and are very different from what a conventional design would be. But of course, uh, eventually you have to be able to stand against your building and um, be able to uh, pass it. And this is where the professional consultants, uh, fortunately, uh, we've worked with the same uh, team of professional consultants. That's the quantity surveyors, the structural engineer, mechanical and electrical engineer. The team that I've worked with over the years have grown confident uh, enough to know that these buildings can stand, can pass the test of time, and they're willing to put their names on it. And that's a big one uh, because uh, usually the biggest red tip to cross over with a recycled building uh, in terms of materials is the council uh, submission uh, because no nobody wants to put their uh, professional indemnity in there. But in our case, because of the R&D, the research development and innovation and uh, the precedents we've created, we're able to test the buildings, get the MPA of the concrete, sure that that concrete is actually stronger than conventional concrete, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and submit those buildings. So what that does is it's created a bit of a shift uh, uh, um, with clients and developers starting to realize that this is actually uh, doable. All right, thank you, Mr. Kimmel. Thank you, Professor Mary, for the question. Any chance that we have a question in the crowd? On all of the projects that you had, both in the community center as well as the others, they were designed with the community in mind. What inspired you to keep the community in mind on all of those projects? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. What inspired me to? Sorry, what inspired you to keep the community in mind on all of your projects, even the projects that were designed with just one person in mind, the community was involved in all of them? Um, it's because, so I use a tool called asset-based community mapping processes where you try and engage the community as much as possible. And what that does is it creates ownership. Uh, so the community uh, the project you're building belongs to them, but it also creates an ownership in the sense of uh, they've had a say. Uh, uh, you as the architect, have, you've given them the pencil to lead that design process. And eventually, you know, you will you put all those designs together and they will see uh, when you uh, respect uh, their contribution or when you accept their contribution and uh, manifest it in a design. So um, the... The ownership part is a big deal, uh, especially with recycled materials, because uh, in South Africa or in large communities, uh, that has been a hurdle uh, that we've had to, uh, to jump over, uh, especially when um, um, these communities are uh, oriented towards looking at brick and mortar as uh, the better superior building, uh, superior material. Uh, the other thing about it is 
the by engaging uh, um, communities with this uh, design, then you're able to leave behind um, capacity because it's low tech, it's low uh, low tech, uh, and uh, it's easier um, to create uh, possibilities of businesses. Um, uh, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, in Joslova, where we build that community center, we worked with a carpenter. When we started the project, uh, we identified the carpenter. Uh, that said he was building dog kennels, you know, very simple structures. And by the time we were done with our building, we realized that he had caught on fire. He had started seeing how to, be, uh, to build bigger structures. And uh, by the time we were done, uh, the next time we visited him, we, we extended his house into a workshop. He's employed six youth. He builds gates, windows, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he's able to expand and use this knowledge that we have left behind. So it's creating capacity within the community and impacting, creating a, a, a larger social impact. The, the larger social impact, uh, the footprint, if you want to um, enlarge it, you really have to look into the community and see uh, the assets that are there, but also see where to build capacity. For us, naturally, as architects, uh, this is one area, or as builders, this is one area we can impact in. So I try very much to ensure that I'm absorbing uh, as many youth or I'm leaving behind as much capacity or uh, replicable architecture. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Um, we have another question in the uh, Q&A. Uh, Emily, would you like to? This kind of architecture kind of engages me. Sorry. Um, Uh, this kind of architecture engages me. I really like uh, helping like less fortunate communities with architecture. I think that we have the power to impact those communities the most. Um, how would someone like coming out of college or in college be able to get involved in projects like this or like the ones you get involved in, I guess? Um, I, I think so. Uh, um, some of the partners or organizations that I've worked with um, uh, is through volunteerism. Um, the the uh, being able to volunteer your time, work in your community or work in another community, use your skill set. Uh, taking a gap year, for example, um, gap years in, in in South Africa are very popular just because you're able to kind of a gap year is between your undergrad and your masters where you can go away and be involved in a project, and you choose whether you can be in um, uh, practice, or you could volunteer your time in a community built project. So those are uh, some of the avenues I can think of. I think uh, in creating uh, uh, this kind of impact, uh, the truth though is that just remember, I was a professional architect before, you know, um, uh, after my studies in uh, architecture, I went into practice. I practiced for um, two, three years. And even during my study years, I, do, I was already working for architecture firms. I think that experience, uh, why I'm highlighting that is that experience was crucial uh, in creating the foundation of this work. Uh, really understanding the challenges of the built environment, uh, submission of plans, the kind of questions that they ask uh, in the municipality, uh, LSFs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, understanding the practice of mainstream architect before stepping away to be able to create an alternative and bring that alternative into the main space. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is there is no real formula into where you can start. Um, you start with what is uh, accessible for you. Uh, if you can volunteer, that's one way. Uh, if you want to take a gap here, that's another way. Um, if you have to work uh, straight from college uh, because you have to pay, I imagine you guys also have loans and things like that, do it. And when you get the opportunity, uh, uh, wherever it is later in your career, you will be able to come and come back and engage with it. I think uh, just being intuitive and being sensitive um, uh, to the needs of others uh, and those who cannot afford us as, as architects is something you will, it, it will be there. 
and uh, uh, hopefully uh, mainstream practice doesn't numb that because that's what happens. You know, after a while, you just get numb. You know, um, this is what's practice, and you kind of forget about it. But us having this conversation uh, definitely does plant a seed uh, for you to kind of have it at the back of your mind that you do need to give uh, a bit of your time and uh, help uh, those who are less fortunate in society. I think we have one more question. Um, on how did your retrade program impact the community on a larger scale and what benefits did you see um, with that program that were brought to the community? So with which community, uh, which program? Um, the retrade program. Ah, all right. So the um, if if I understand the retrade program you're talking about, Kustas, uh, which is a recycling bike project. Well, what we were trying to tackle there was waste in uh, communities in the township. And what was what happens there is there is a lot of waste that is not recycled, and it. The reason why it's not recycled is because the um, main recycling industry cannot get into the township space. So what we did was track a waste beacon, understand what the challenges were, uh, right from the hazards of the job to uh, the challenges of uh, creating a livelihood uh, and to, to the distances traveled. At the same time, we realized we needed to create a in-between space. Um, uh, between himself and where he was doing the butter trade and the city itself. And this is where the retreat project was really crucial. So with the retreat uh, project, we created a community uh, recycling, let me call it hub or um, facility where waste could be brought in already um, uh, sorted out so that it can be housed for maybe a day or two and then collected uh, thereafter. And what, what it is, if you can imagine, we have these facilities in every uh, block or in every uh, district um, uh, or region. So you have these mini recycling facilities uh, that not only do the people from the township bring their waste to, to get money uh, and to get food, but even we who are privileged can take our waste material and give it to somebody else to make a living out of. Uh, because um, uh, a lot of times um, we, you know, we have, we do not see the uh, waste as a resource, but someone else does see it as a resource and it can impact their lives. So this kind of a retrading f um, facility is in some pool of one, uh, that's the one in Port Elizabeth. But that's been a collaboration of uh, Kusta, uh, the community that is works uh, he worked for, an NGO that is willing to run with the idea and get support. Because uh, you can imagine it takes a lot, you know, uh, get a piece of land, uh, have the community agree on to that, have a butter trade system, uh, have the main waste uh, industry uh, agree to uh, collect uh, all this waste that's brought together from one point and give the money to it, you know? So it's, there's a whole logistic system in, uh, or there's a whole machine that uh, we've had to uh, kind of gradually build up. Great, thank you, Kevin. Uh, on that note, I think we're probably going to um, call it there. I wanna thank Nomas uh, so much for her participation, for again, bringing Kevin here. Kevin, thank you so much too. The work was absolutely fantastic. I think um, we all learned a nice amount. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you also, Emily, Gibran, uh, Gibran, uh, Annalise Hayden, Smith, Jesse, uh, and also Victoria McReynolds, who's the advisor for NOMAS. Um, I thought that was tremendous. Um, Kevin, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Cool. On that note, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Um, we have one more lecture on deck for this semester, and so you'll hear about that in the coming weeks. But thank you so much for coming out.